Okay, everyone. Uh, hello, and welcome to a surprise ambush stream from Sitra Podcast. Uh, if I could get a two-second sound test from uh, from Jen, are you on our stream? Can you hear both me and Piotr? If you could please give me a sound test, please, at your convenience. Uh, Piotr, um, can you go ahead and say something so we can check and make sure that we can... Yeah, okay. okay. Hello, everybody. Um, Jen, just let me know if we can hear um, Piotr as well as myself. Okay, you can hear me. Can you hear Piotr as well? Hello, okay, Sam. Cool. Awesome. We're cool. Here. All right, we are live, and we have no sound issues for a change. Hooray. <laughs> this is the first time for everything, folks. Um, is this live? Yes, guys. They say the pro one of the primary elements in, vict in successful warfare is the element of surprise. We are launching a surprise stream today. This is going to be a super fast one. Oh, hold on. Speaking of surprises, OBS wants to surprise me. Sorry about that. Uh, there we go. We're back. Um, so again, uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we're going to do a, a short stream because I'm technically on my lunch hour um, at my job. We are all working from home, but we still got a lunch hour, so I'm going to put this lunch hour to good use. And uh, we are going to play some Valor and Victory with my friend Piotr. Uh, hello, Piotr. How are you doing? Hello, everybody. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? There's a little hum in the background, but not bad here. Yeah, that's the processor fan. I can't really do anything about that right now. Um, oh, actually, no, it's not. It's my actual, uh, whatchamacallit fan. Hold on one second, guys. All right, hopefully that makes the background noise a little bit better. <clears throat> So again, uh, I don't think we're going to finish. Th this game is already in progress. I'm not entirely sure we're going to finish this stream today. Um, but uh, again, because I'm on my lunch hour, I can't do this whole afternoon, unfortunately. Um, but we're going to take, uh, you know, this whole uh, this whole virus thing and having to work from home. We're going to we're going to take our lemons and make lemonade. We're going to do something useful and fun with it. So what we started on Saturday, uh, uh, Piotr and I, was a um, game of Valor and Victory with some new armies and some new units created for the Battle of Dien Ben Phu. Uh, Dien, Dien Ben Phu took place in uh, 1953 and 54. It was pretty much the big ending battle of uh, what they called the, or what they would eventually call the First Indochina War. This is uh, the Vietnam War prequel, so to speak. Um, this is the battle that would cost the French. Um, or, or that, that would cause a French defeat in that war. Uh, I'll have one more OBS issue. Sorry, everybody. Hello, OBS, and close, please. Or not close, um, minimize. I find that when you minimize OBS, the, that, that annoying pop-up uh, happens a little less often. So I'm trying to minimize uh, some of our technical issues. Uh, but back to the history. Again, super fast, because I don't want to go into all the uh, all the things here. Um, there was a Vietnam War, as some people in the stream may or may not be aware, there was a Vietnam War before the Vietnam War. So the Americans, the Australians, that part of the Vietnam War, of course, that all takes place uh, through the 60s and into the 70s. In the 50s, actually started off in the 40s, uh, in the 40s and the 50s, uh, the French um, had a battle here. This uh, Vietnam, Laos, and uh, Cambodia were a part of a uh, colony that used to be called French Indochina. And after the Japanese were thrown out of French Indochina at the end of World War I, Two, um, the French wanted their colonies back, and uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, people uh, in French Indochina had other ideas, and so almost immediately a war started. Um, we the two sides were pretty much the French and some of their allies trying to hold on to these possessions, and uh, communists uh, called the Viet Minh. They weren't called the Viet Cong yet or the NBA yet. They were called the Viet Minh. It was a different organization under some of the same leaders. Um, and uh, you know, they started this huge war uh, to try and get the French out of uh, out of what they were hoping was going to be an independent and united Vietnam. It didn't quite work out that way. Um, but the battle that the Viet Minh, or the battle where the Viet Minh won that war was Dien Bien Phu. So super fast, because again, I don't want to turn this into a big history stream. Um, this is the northern part of North Vietnam that we see here. And what winds up happening is uh, the... French had the idea to parachute in about, a, uh, what was it, do you think, uh, Piotr, uh, between ten and 13,000? Yeah, something like that. I, be, I believe it was 13,000 men. Yeah, um, <clears throat> there was uh, French uh, paratroopers, uh, French Foreign Legion, um, North African uh, colonial troops went in there with them. And we had some local allies, uh, the Montagnard tribesmen, tribesmen and so on. You add all that together, you come up with something like 
something like between 10 and 13,000 men. And they dropped into this area that they hoped was going to be uh, vital for the Viet Minh to continue to continue their war effort. Um, apparently, they never watched um, a bridge too far, because uh, this yeah. is the area that the uh, that the French controlled, and uh, of the of the, uh, of the uh, northern part of Vietnam. They dropped their troops way the hell over here, like I can't even tell. That's like 150 miles away, and then nobody went to go get them. Um, they literally just dropped them there. They set up an air base. Nobody went to go and relieve them. That was just going to be their plan. And then from this base, they were going to try to keep, uh, you know, air air uh, supplies coming in here. And from this base, they were going to range out and disrupt Viet Minh's um, operations in the backcountry and shut down the communist efforts in the northern part of uh, what was going to become Vietnam. Technically, it wasn't Vietnam yet. Uh, the plan, needless to say, didn't work. Um... I'm not even going to try and pronounce his name because I always get it wrong. General Jiap uh, surrounded this place with something like 50,000 combat troops and 50,000 support troops. So we're talking about 100,000 men surrounding 13,000 men. The 13,000 men are in this valley. They're at the bottom of this valley. The 100,000 men are on all the hills that surround the valley. So they have all the high ground. And they also have tons of artillery. There's an entire Viet Minh artillery division, the 300... Uh, 351st. Um, it's it's in a division of entirely artillery. Kachusha rocket batteries, 122 millimeter field guns left over from World War II. Uh, these poor uh, Frenchmen and their allies were pretty much doomed from the start. And again, I won't get into too much of the history, but this it's, it, it turned into a big siege in the late uh, in, in the late part of 1953, early part of 1954. Um, it's uh, Rourke's Drift times 100 without the happy ending. Um, the Zulus did not did not go away at the end of this battle. They kept coming until they were all overrun. Um, and the defeat was so bad for the French that it pretty much threw the French out of what would become North Vietnam. Um, and when they left, uh, you know, there was all kinds of diplomatic wrangling that went on from 1954 into the 1960s, early 1960s, mid-1960s. By then the war had started. This time the Americans are involved. And that's where we get what we know more classically as the Vietnam War. But anyway... Um, so they, they dropped a bunch of troops in here. They set up an air base. They had all these, uh, air, ba they had all these, uh, redoubts. They had all these little, uh, fortification areas. Um, legend has it. They're all named after the mistresses of the garrison commander. Uh, I don't know what this guy was doing on Saturday night, but he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine girlfriends. Um, yeah, Isabel's down here by herself. Uh, along with uh, three more girlfriends for his drop zones. Drop zone Octavia, Natasha, and Simone. So this guy's got literally 12 girlfriends all at once. Uh, no wonder he lost the war because he didn't have any time to actually lead his troops. Um, <laughs> he was busy doing something <laughs> else, I guess. Um, but I don't even know if that's true. But that those were the call signs. Those were the actual code names for these uh, for these op bases. One of the first ones to really come under threat was Beatrice. So that's what we're doing today. We're doing uh, a company of French Foreign Legion that has uh, based out Beatrice, moving north out of Beatrice and trying to clear some of this high ground that's near Beatrice that the Viet Minh are using for artillery to bombard these French positions. Um, so we have uh, a company of the French Foreign Legion, paratroopers specifically. Uh, we made up these counters during the week and we're trying them out for the first time. We have completed turn one um, of our game so far. Our game was very simply, uh, again, this is a this is a very first play test of these new counters and and uh, and armies, so to speak, um, in the Valor and Victory system. Valor and Victory, by the way, I should give credit super fast. Designed by Barry Doyle, and it's uh, available to free print and play at valor-and-victory.com. Obviously, it was written for World War II. We've used it for all kinds of uh, conflicts here on the Sitrep podcast, everything from World War One to 1993 Somalia. And you do have to make some adjustments, um, but 1954 is almost exactly like 1954 with hand-me-down weapons, second-hand weapons. It's almost exactly the same as World War II. So this was an easy one. Somalia, not so much. But this one was actually pretty easy. So in Valor and Victory, what we've done here is we've set up the Viet Minh in positions on the northern half of the table. And then what happened, or the northern part of the table, I should say. And then the French have been coming in from the south. 
And uh, again, the French are trying to clear out these high ground, uh, these points of bald high ground. Un you cleared out high ground. We have one victory condition hex here. We have one victory hex here. And we have a, a little hooch hex up here. These are observation posts that the Viet Minh are using to direct their artillery. That has been absolutely murderous already. It's, we're now on March uh, 1953, uh, 1954 on uh, that, that French air base that we were looking at before. Um, so Piotr is playing the French. Um, he came in from the south. He's got some high ground. He's trying to approach some of my hooches here in this little uh, saddle in this uh, on this on this ridge that runs from southwest to northeast. Uh, this guy up here, this commander, was able to see some of his troops coming up this mountain trail. Uh, I directed some mortar fire on him. I got some good die rolls, and I blew up a, a fire team and his medic, uh, one of his medics. Um, his medic has expired, but that fire that that fire team, that half squad, is still there bleeding out. One of Piotr's um, priorities now is to get to that casualty and save his life, secure him and get him off the table. Um, if that happens, the casualty counts less for my victory points. If the casualty is allowed to die, there are bleed out rules. If the casualty is allowed to die or, God forbid, gets captured by the Viet Minh, then I get full victory points for him. So there's a mechanic in the game to incentivize the free world player to take care of his casualties uh, through the use of uh, units like these medics that we made up. Um, so we've completed one turn of the game. He came on first, then I had my fire phase that happened after that. Uh, I, I laid it some, some lucky hits uh, with my mortar barrage. Uh, my PPSH fire, again, these Viet, again, this is the Viet Min, not the Viet Cong, so no AKs or SKSs or things like that. Um, the stuff that you normally see in quote-unquote Vietnam movies. We have this stuff. These guys have opened fire on these guys. Not only did I score no hits, but in Valorant Victory, if you ever roll boxcars, which is the worst roll you can roll in this game, an enemy sniper can sometimes appear. And sure enough, we have an enemy sniper on the board now. So I have to watch out for that. So there's one lone Frenchman out there with a uh, with a uh, FN or an FA. What, what's the name of the rifle? I sh actually should know this. Uh, uh, a, a, a Mat 49 rifle and a scope, and he's uh, he's trying to pick off some of my guys. So we've completed turn one. We're now at the beginning of turn two, and we're going to go ahead and start with uh, what I'm dreading a little bit is um, the French command phase. So uh, Piotr, take it away. It's now your turn for turn two. <clears throat> okay. So since since it's my first game of uh, Valon Victory, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing <laughs> yet. Uh, but I believe that <clears throat> when it comes to this uh, uh, squads <clears throat> in what I believe is uh, India 10, uh, south of the Hutus, uh, I would like one of the full squads to be divided into two half squads. Okay. If that's possible. Yep. Uh, a, a subject to stacking conditions, so I'm going to ask which full squad you want to divide. Go ahead. Uh, uh, the first one? Uh, this under Laurent. Okay. So this is in India okay. 10, yes? Yep, yep, no problem. Yep. That's easy to do. And uh, so, okay, so what Piotr's going to do here, he's going to take this full squad, 656, six, so it's got full squad numbers, and you can also tell because it's got two figures on it. And he's going to divide it into two half squads. So I'm going to go ahead and eliminate that unit. I'm going to take uh, one of my half squad figures here and uh, du duplicate it twice. And put them in the same hex. Okay. Now, uh, that hex is still legal because you're allowed to have, again, for people in the chat, one, two, three, four. You're allowed to have four infantry units in a stack. And medics and officers do count as infantry units. So you're allowed to divide that one, but again, just for people in the chat, and also because, like you were saying before, this is your first game of Valor and Victory, you would not be allowed to split the second squad as well, because that would result in five um, infantry units in the same hex. Okay, cool. Would like to do the same for Juliet 9. Alrighty. So deleting the full squad and replacing with two half squads. Whether you're playing electronically or on the board with physical counters, guys, you want to be really careful when you're doing this because it's easy to lose track of change. And before you know it, people start, uh, you can either shortchange yourself or your troops can start having unauthorized babies. And before you know it, you have too many units on the board. Um, <laughs> you got to be careful there. Okay, um, any other uh, consolidations or divisions? Mm, uh, not really. So thank okay. you for that. Uh, I would like to call in a light barrage on uh, 
uh, on India, what India, India, India eight, uh, where you have this free two half squats and a full squat. Okay. So one light light brush over there. Um. All right. That, okay. So what uh, Piotr's talking about is his order of battle for this game includes three barrages of light, uh, light of, of basically well they call it light barrages. As you can tell by the pictures, we're we're talking about mortars. These are the mortars that are coming in from this area down here. So his guys are way over here, up here in this jungly uh, uh, high ground, way up here, and probably half a mile away, maybe maybe a mile, maybe even two miles. Uh, mortar fire is coming in, and uh, you know, at the direction of his officers. Speaking of which, he does have a leader. Leaders are these guys uh, here with a little officer um, icon on them with line of sight on the intended target hex. So he's going to go ahead and try and call in a light barrage. Let me make sure these are all uh, at the highest level of the spreadsheet here. Otherwise, we lose track of them. Go away. Okay, so one light barrage on there. Okay, did you want to call in? You can call in more than one light barrage on a single hex because they can drift. Or you can call in a bunch of other light barrages on other targets that you can see as well. Also, uh, we have fighter bombers. Again, but just, go ahead. Can I combine a fighter bomber on one hex with a light barrage, or is it illegal? Um, there's no rule that says you can't. At least mm -hmm. not in Valorant Victory. There are so some was... rules in, in some other games where you're not allowed to do that. I actually had that once in GDW Assault. I was calling artillery and an Apache gun strike, and it's like, no, your artillery shells will hit your planes. Valor and Victory does not try to get that detailed. If you've got it, you can spend it. The problem is, again, you only have so many. So you can do yeah, a fighter but... barrage and a uh, light barrage on the same axe. I was thinking of a fighter bar uh, barrage on uh, Juliet uh, 7, I believe. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, Fuchs? Yep. Over there. And uh, actually, actually, I think it will, it will be all when it comes to calling in some strikes. Okay. Um, no worries. The roll is 1 to 4 on a D6. Mm -hmm. So 1 to 4 on D6, it lands where you want it. If it's a 5, it drifts by 1 hex. If he rolls a 6, it drifts by 2 hexes. Yes, it is very possible for you to hit your own troops if you're very unlikely. If he rolls a six on this light barrage, that means it drifts two hexes. And then on the clock ray method, he rolls a four. North is always one. One, two, three, four. He will literally shell his own men. Um, but again, it's, you know, we see that stuff happen in Vietnam War movies all the time. Um, so, okay, you're all set. Um, are those the only two you want to call in at this time? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's no right. uh, so for the light barrage, roll 1d6 and try to get a 1 through a 4. It's a 3. Cool, it lands where you wanted it to. Epic. Mm -hmm. So we will resolve that super fast. So a light barrage... Oh, that's the wrong table. Light barrage is 29 to 40. You want to roll as low as you can. Now... I get plus two to your roll because I am in woods. However, mm -hmm. and again, I'm not sure if this is a house rule, but this is definitely how we play all the time. The commander who's calling it in gets to apply his leadership bonus. Because um, he's calling in the artillery. A good officer will call in an accurate artillery mission. A crappy officer will call in a poor artillery mission. Um, so people who follow... The... Go ahead. I don't remember, but I believe that uh, in the woods uh, you get the double damage, yes? Because of the yes, shackles? Yes, that's absolutely true. I did forget about that. So, okay, there's, so, so there's, a, there's a couple descriptions here, or a couple modifiers here. First of all, uh, again, I'm explaining everything for people in the chat. Yes, he does have, um, he, he's on this column, okay? He has to add two to his roll as a penalty, an a, 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 when you add to your die roll, because you want to roll low in this game, if you want to roll high, uh, uh, there's a plus two penalty, that's a that's a penalty because of my woods. There's a negative one bonus because of the commander, the skill of the commander that's calling in the mission. It's a negative one officer. So it's a net negative one. Uh, sorry, it's a net positive one. Plus two, minus one. Um, whatever he l ends up landing on, so if he rolls, say, a six, a natural six, okay, he gets to add, he has to add two because of my woods. He has to subtract one, or he gets to subtract one because of his commander. He winds up with a modified seven, which reads four. 
Because I'm in woods, there's an airburst rule in Valorant Victory for calling in mortar fire. That number will be doubled. So it's up to you, sir, to roll as low as you can. Net, you have to add uh, one to the roll. Please roll as low as you can. Because I want the stream to be... I'll fired. try. Okay. <laughs> so it's a six. A natural six. Is it right? Yes. Okay, so it's exactly what we just described. Six gets modified to eight because of my woods. Gets remodified down to a seven because of the skill of the commander that's calling in the fire mission. He lands on a four. Okay, the airburst rule does uh, come into effect. Uh, that that's not a house rule. That's actually in the Valorant victory as written. Um, that's because the shells are exploding in the trees and scattering the uh, scattering the shrapnel down on the troops. So, like we see in Episode 6 of Band of Brothers, air bursts, tree bursts, are actually a lot worse. This is the days before they implemented and in, uh, before they invented and widely implemented. That's the hard part. Widely implemented. Um, something that we, we now take for granted. Uh, proximity fused ammunition. If the shell hits the ground and then blows up, like we see in the old World War II movies, a big column of dirt goes up, you're actually giving away 75% of the artillery blast. It's absorbed by the earth and the dirt and all that stuff like that. If it explodes 20 to 30 feet over the men, that's, that's like a nuclear bomb. It's a lot, lot worse, because now that shrapnel rains down on the troops unimpeded. That's what's happening here because of those tree bursts. So, um, let's make this a long story short. Do not take a shot. It's only 11 o'clock here in the States. It's way too early to be drinking. Um, but, I, okay, so I have to pay a total of eight casualty points. Because, again, he wound up with four. I know I'm over-explaining this, but, again, people in the chat and Piotr's first time in the game. He started off with four. That doubles to eight because of tree bursts. So, this is the total amount of stuff that was in the hex. Um, the last number is what they call the casualty rating, 2, 2, and 4. Um, you can sometimes get away with doing something sneaky, like, okay, I'm going to kill those 4, I'm going to kill those 2, and then I'm going to pin this guy for 1. That still leaves me only with 7. There, I, I've, I've kind of, I, I can't think of a way to save any of those guys. I'm pretty sure that that motor, uh, 1530 over there, and, uh, guys, okay, guys, then go ahead and take that shot, man. Um... We got people in the chat already getting uh, already, already getting drunk. <laughs> That's great. Cheers, guys. There you go. <laughs> um, I uh, I can't I can't find a way to save any of these guys. I'm pretty sure that that light barrage has totally uh, blown that unit up. So just for fun, I'm gonna put a little. Oh, there's one. I've got one. Oh, it was fun until I wrecked the map doing it. All right, sorry <laughs> about that. You put this much graphics in an Excel spreadsheet and you have some latency issues that cause uh, some some problems. What the deuce? I'm really confused now. I wanted the whole group, Mr. Excel. Okay, cool. Yeah, these guys are all destroyed. There's no real way that I can get uh, KG, so to speak, um, with the uh, points. And, and try to, you know, because, okay, in Valorant Victory, you have to, okay, so much damage gets done on a hex, and done, done on the units in that hex. You have to account for that many casualty points. You can account for casualty points in two ways. By one, subtracting that number of casualty points, that's the simple way. Or number two, you can pin a unit for one casualty point. But even if <clears throat> I try to pin units, now, here's a quick example. And again, I don't want to slow the stream down too much here, but let's pretend for a second that that half squad, that, that full squad, was divided into two half squads. This is the, some of the stuff I. So let's say I had to eliminate this. Same number of casualty points. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I can pin the last one for seven. Yeah, never mind. I'm still screwed. Uh, okay, never mind. All right, that was a whole big aside for no reason. I apologize. Sometimes when your units are more split out into half squads rather than full squads, you can get a little bit sneakier with the with the casualty. Because again, when you pin a full squad, that counts as one casualty point. When you pin a half squad, that counts as a full casualty point. So when you're under a lot of fire, sometimes it actually makes sense to have more half squads and less full squads. And that's literally your men spreading out in the hex and trying to uh, avoid some of the fire. But um, none of that, unfortunately, has happened. So I am looking at... The battery's falling out of my mouse here. 
I am looking at one, two. That's a full squad, so that counts as two. Three, four victory points uh, for the French. And that is one light barrage used up. That's the uh, good news, I guess. <laughs> okay, let's see what's going on with that fighter bomber strike. Again, 1d4 to see... Um, actually, that was up here. 1d4... Uh, to, I'm sorry, 1d6, and you want to roll a 4 or less to see if it, see if that fighter bomber hits where you want it to. Okay. Um, sadly, it's a 5. Okay, so it scatters by one hex. So roll, so it lands up here on a 1. Roll 1d6 to see which hex it lands on. And it's a 6. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They bombed in my other guys. <laughs> <laughs> Come good, on. Good shooting, Tex. Okay, so... Um, fighter bombers do not get that double rule because it's not a mortar strike and you do have to add two for the woods you do have an officer calling in and that's a negative one so now you're on this blue row and you have to add net plus one to 2d6 mm -hmm. it's a four a four, natural four a natural four becomes a modified five that's five victory uh, I'm sorry five casualty points again there's only four casualty points in that hex so that's two more destroyed units and I will not launch into a long and pointless um, description and explanation of the casualty assessment rules. Um, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so it doesn't get in the way of the game. All right, so that pretty much blew the whole front end off of my army. Um, good job. <laughs> Even the one that you missed wound up not missing because it just hit somebody else. Oh, man. They are going to be problematic in those coaches. <laughs> But um, I still got some onboard mortars, and I'm going to use them. You got some onboard. <clears throat> okay, so that's going to complete your command phase. We now go to your direct fire phase. Yep. Now it's time to start using your onboard assets. Everything from pistols True. to mortars. Okay. So, so I've got some mortars in uh, India 12, I believe, and I would like to shoot them uh, into I don't know Juliet 7, I believe. Was uh, Hutchis. So the mortar battery he's talking about is where mortars kind of belong, back in the back. Um, the only rule about mortars, uh, this doesn't apply here, but just for people in the chat, is you're not allowed to fire them from inside buildings. Um, sometimes there are rules in Stalingrad scenarios that kind of circumvent that, special scenario rules, because what the Russians used to do is open up a hole in the roof of the building they could fire the mortars through. But your uh, your mortars are not in buildings, so that doesn't apply here. Okay, who's calling in the mortar? Strike. In Navar. Uh, I believe he's that. in Mike 12. Var is in Mike. Okay, my, here he is down here. He can see the target hex. So you always measure everybody from the center of the hex to the center of the hex. He can, well, we, we discussed this earlier in the game. Yes, he can barely see that unit. Now, you might look at the map and say, Ariskany, you're going crazy because there's a whole bunch of trees between... Navarre and uh, the target hex. Again, so if you look at the contours of the terrain, he's on level 3, level 1, level 2, level 3. He's looking over this valley and over those trees, and he can now see this uh, this hex. This hex call does present a slight problem for direct fire because you're, you're what, what they call grazing fire. You're shooting right past it. Uh, so no matter what the elevations are, if you're right behind cover, it gives you cover. Um, you can't see over it no matter how high you are because you're right behind it. So the only hex that's a possible issue is this one right here. However, I can if we measure from middle of the hex to middle of the hex, that's why there's a dot in the center of every hex, you'll see that the line of sight scrapes right past that. If this was a direct fire, that would apply as a penalty to him. It's like a somewhat obscured, you know, a half cover in any miniature game. Um, but here, he just we just wanted to assess whether or not he could see it at all. The answer is yes. He can call on the mortar strike. Mortars give no shits about any trees because they come straight down from out of the sky, as mortars do. So, we have negative two because Navarre is calling in the strike. Your commanders are so important in Valorant Victory. Plus two because I am in buildings. For Valorant Victory players out there, yes, I know vi buildings are usually plus three. I usually give plus two because this is literally like a bamboo hut. All right, and in, even in my European games, I usually have buildings as two because they're usually heavily damaged. A fully intact stone building normally counts as three. Stone, brick, mortar, that kind of thing. 
For a building that's literally built out of big grass, I always give a plus two. So, plus two, minus two, the mortars are worth six points as a heavy support weapon. That's that first six. Um, is the long and short of that. Let's roll 2d6. We are now on this little white row here. And again, you're trying to roll as low as you can. No net modifier. Alright. So, I've got a six. A six is two casualty points. Now here, I can get a little cagey with my... Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pin down. Two, um, two half squats. So I have to assess two casualty points. I'm going to go ahead and pin down two units, kill nobody, and now this other half squad that carries the light machine gun and this full squad is still okay and ready for action. <laughs> yeah, that hex uh, is tough. It's maximum stack. There's a full squad on there. There's a support weapon. They're in buildings, quote unquote. Now, if Piotr makes this assault, if he assaults into that hex, any pinned down unit automatically vanishes, is instantly destroyed at no cost to him. This is where Valor and Victory starts to encourage combined arms kind of stuff. You pin the enemy down with either support weapons, light machine guns, heavy machine guns if you have them, off-board support, you pin the enemy down. Even if you don't kill him, you pin him down, and then you assault. It's classic fire and maneuver. It's literally infantry combat 101. Talk to anybody who has served in any military. That's what they're going to tell you right off the bat. And Valor and Victory tries to actually encourage that. Um, okay, so that so far is going to be this guy who has now done his fire phase. We've got other guys that might be able to do a fire phase. Uh, I, I believe that... In, anybody else can really see anything yet. Uh, I think that uh, in Mike 12 you have a, a light machine gun uh, uh, with Navar. Uh, I think he's in reach, but it's, you know, uh, two or three to, to do something, actually. But it's worth trying, I believe. Okay. So, um, again, the first number is the attack firepower. The second number is the range and hexes, normally governed by the size of the bullet. What really determines range in real warfare is the caliber of the weapon that you're firing. This is why we have 50 caliber sniper rifles running around in Vietnam and uh, in Afghanistan. Um, so, you'll notice that the Viet Minh almost all have fours. That's pistol ammunition because they're all carrying submachine guns. Again, this is before AKs. The French have a combination of Mat 49 uh, submachine guns and uh, rifles. So, it, uh, six is usually range for rifles, four is usually the range for machine guns. So, when I designed these French Foreign Legion counters, again, not my game system, that's Barry Doyle's, but these counters are mine. That's why I gave them a range of five. They're a mix of these, um, these short rifles and. Um, and some machine guns. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six hexes away. You'll quickly notice, uh, everybody, that nobody can reach. His pistol only reaches, or submachine gun only reaches to four. His rifles only reach to five. His rifles only reach to five. Um, however, there is a light machine gun that reaches to six. So out of this whole stack, the only thing that can fire is this half squad operating this light machine gun. Now, normally you can fire both. The guys can fire their, their, their normal weapons, their personal weapons, and their light machine gun. But again, the normal weapons will not reach. So literally only all he can do is uh, operate that light machine gun at this distance. But he can't do that because he's barely in range. The range is six. However, he's got to scrape past that, uh, again, the Juliet 8 um, hex we were talking about before. And he has to shoot into my buildings. Now, Navar can help. Navar can still apply his direction. Um, so that's negative two, plus two for my buildings, plus one for scraping past Juliet 8 here. So it's a net plus one. It's a bit of a shot in the dark because he's on the very lowest column. He's on one to four. He's only got two, so he falls into the one to four row. And he gets to, um, what did I say? He has to add one to his roll. So he has to roll a five or less, really, on 2d6. Okay, let's do this. And you won't believe it, but it's a six, so no, uh, no effect. Six is barely no effect. The building saved him. 
Okay. Okay. Now the question: um, If uh, if the heavy machine gun in uh, Golf uh, Ten, does he see these guys in the Fujis? Because nope. I'm not sure. No, he does not, because he is looking straight through. Um, no problem with the smoke, that's just decoration, but he, uh, he cannot see through the hooches in India 9, or both of these um, tree hexes, India 8 and uh, Juliet 8. Okay, okay, so now I know everything. So I believe that's all for the fire phase, I cannot see anything else to shoot. So well, now of the movement. You killed it's everybody just... you could see with your mortars in your plane, so I have no sympathy for you. <laughs> ah, come on. <laughs> You'll be stuck. Mm, okay. So off to movement. Uh, so I believe that. Uh, do I have smoke in this mission available or not? Um, mortars can always drop smoke. And so when it comes to infantry units. Um, the way you do it, to my knowledge, I think is smoke. Is the way you do with either you can either use a light barrage, or you can mm -hmm. have your 60 millimeter mortar fire smoke. Oh, okay. So, uh, or, or, all right. Because I believe, uh, I, I think that in the rules it was said that you can use uh, smoke through infantry before they move. Uh, plus one smoke. Uh, but I won't argue. I honestly, can take, don't take know. Later. I, honestly, I honestly don't remember. You, yeah. you, could, you, could, very, you could very easily be right. Well, we can check that later. So okay. let's assume that I, I, I don't have uh, smoke right now. Okay. Okay, so uh, first things first. Uh, we will try to get these guys in uh, Juliet 9 and do an um, assault move uh, to Juliet 8. All right. So assault move, uh, for people in the chat, is when you move half of your distance or less. You're really going slow. You're on your belly. It gives you an automatic, no matter what the cover is in that hex, even if it's nothing, an automatic plus one. It also makes it easier to avoid booby traps. That's a house rule. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, uh, okay. So if you're done moving that stack, go ahead and roll for booby traps because you're mm -hmm. in assault movement. You only hit a booby trap on a natural 12. Okay. Very, un very unlikely. It's an eight. Cool. No worries. So no booby trap there. Booby traps guys are a, uh, are completely my own hex. Again, Valorant victory is written for World War II. I've been rewriting it for anything after World War II, asymmetrical warfare. So that's where we get casualty evacuation, booby traps, prisoners of war, civilians, helicopters, all that post-World War II stuff. Um, but he avoided the booby trap because he's, number one, lucky. Number two, he's being very smart and cautious. I'm only going to be at one hex. Uh, I will, however, take opportunity fire because now he's right next to me. So opportunity fire is um, always a plus two when it's right next to you because he's moving. However, I have no officers in that hex, unfortunately for me. So no bonuses for officers. He gets the, bon the, the bonus of the hex that he's in. He's in regular woods, so he gets plus two for that. And he's using assault moves, so he gets plus three. I cannot also I can also not fire my uh, pin down units. This is where it's smart that he pinned down units before he made the assault. Or I'm assuming he's going to make an assault. I shouldn't say that. So all I have in there is a total of nine points. No uh, spoilers. A, yep, no spo spoiler zone. <laughs> no uh, nine points. I have to add three to my roll. Oh my god. All right, so here we go. Even with a pretty good roll, that's a pretty good roll. I have to add three to that. So I really wound up with an eight on nine points an eight on nine points is exactly zero look at that. i just missed <laughs> i have a total of nine points so i'm on the five to ten row i wind up with a modified eight if you had not been using assault move you would have taken a casualty but because you guys are literally belly crawling towards me i have scored exactly no damage and that's all they can do that's their fire face mm -hmm. okay, okay cool uh, continue um, with your move they... They cannot shoot anymore. They Even cannot. The they cannot shoot in the upcoming defensive fire phase. No. Uh, that's what I wanted to know. <laughs> when it comes to, I'm, <clears throat> again, I'm not saying that you're going to assault me, but if you assault me, there is a table and they sort of shoot back in an abstract way. But mm -hmm. um, that that's not really shooting. It's more like fist fights and bayonets, uh, and grenades, and so on. Um, True. Which reminds me, I could uh, just for people in the chat, I could have thrown grenades into that, but no worries. Um, 
if I was really smart, I should have had an officer in there. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, go ahead and continue your movement, please. Okay, so let's take India 10, and since I believe you're not able to shoot anything at me, no. let's just m move them to India 8, to Hexes North. India 8. So these guys can definitely not take another round of opportunity fire. Nobody else can really reach them. Whoa. Oh no, come on. <laughs> not the Deshka. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God damn it. Um, yeah, these trees are in a valley between us, so I shoot over top of those trees. These trees are on the same level, but you're not right behind them. However, you are in trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and my officer in there is a negative zero. Uh, again, for Valorant Victory fans who might be watching this on YouTube later, I have invented negative zero officers. Negative zero officers give um, what officers can do. They can make rallies. They can, uh, you know, do different things. Um, they can call in artillery missions or whatever. However, they don't give you a bonus because they're not good enough. This is just another way. When it comes to modern warfare, post-1945 warfare, it's all about quality of the men. It is always important, the quality of men is always a huge factor in warfare, but in post-1945 asymmetrical warfare, it is extremely important. So any game that tries to do modern warfare or post-1945 warfare really has to take into account differences between quality of the men and especially quality of leadership. Um, I do have some good officers in here, he just happens to not be one of them. The douche can reach you, it's going to be a 6 at plus 2. Snake Eyes! Oh, crap. Of course, I didn't have my damn webcam going. Snake <laughs> Eyes. You add two to your for your buildings. So six becomes a four. That is three... Ca oh, no, sorry. That is, yeah, four casualty points. <laughs> four casualty points. Ah, one, two, three, four. Actually, I could pin them all. But I don't know if it's wise. Um, you could yeah. pin them all... And you would literally take no casualties. Um, these guys cannot assault. It's just how much do you think this assault is going to work? Because if that assault doesn't work... Also, at the end of your turn, you get a chance to rally some of these guys. Even with, with a pinned officer? Yes. You just don't get the bonus. Okay. So let's try to, to pin them all. All right, we shall being, see. I, I believe that assault will do its job. He's being very optimistic here, guys. I mean, if, if he pulls this off, it's going to be awesome. Um, super fast. Uh, one other thing, whenever you roll natural snake eye... Oh, wrong button. Sorry, everybody. Whenever you roll natural snake eyes in a game, the people who did it have a chance to become valorous. Um, I don't think that's going to happen here because there's not much in there. So the I literally have to roll a 2 on, 2D, on 2d6 for my half squad to become valorous. Uh, this is more of a formality because, again, I don't like my chances. Yeah, surprise, surprise. The officer becomes valorous on a six or less. <laughs> the officer does not become valorous. Okay, no worries. Valorous units, if you read about it in the game, are, uh, are awesome. Um, I remember I was playing with Dylan in uh, the Falklands, and he had a whole stack go valorous of Royal Marine Commandos. Or it was Royal Marines or Paris. I think it might have been Paris. And uh, they just became unkillable. They were elites. They had a plus two officer with them, and now they were all valorous, which means like they doubled in close assaults. They get to absorb oh the force. Yeah, they, they just became like this unstoppable, not to be funny, but like this virus that just carved through my whole Argentinian company. It, uh, it wasn't but, fun. Pun intended. Right. <laughs> okay, um, any more movement on your end? Yeah, sure. So okay. let's take the medic from India uh, 11 and move him to the casualty uh, hex. In... Okay, just the medic? Yeah, just the medic. Okay. Uh, do me a favor, roll 2d... Um, roll, roll 2d6 for this booby trap up here. Sure. It's uh, 10. Barely. Okay, and then uh -huh. roll a booby trap for your medic. Okay. Oh my god, it's an 11. Oh, uh, he hit a booby trap. Oh no, booby trap. Boom. The medic has now, it's now, now both of your medics are casualties. Oh, it's not good. It's like in Saving Private Ryan, if you get here, who's going to patch you up? That's right. Yeah, okay, maybe. now the good news is regular troops can still evacuate casualties, they just have to make a roll. Medics can do it automatically, that's literally their purpose. Um, 
Bad news. Bad news. All right. The good news is <sighs> now you know where the booby trap is in that hex. Anyone else that moves into that hex does not have to make a booby trap check. Okay, so let's let's move the half squad from. <laughs> from I, I warned you not to run out there, says the half squad. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> All right, and it's in the command phase, or do I try to evacuate them now? Uh, at the end of the turn. Okay, at the or end of the, the after turn. action phase. Now, right. He can only make one roll, so even if he succeeds, he can only evacuate one casualty. So if you want to it's evacuate them both, you may want to send in more than one guy. No, because you can see that hex. <laughs> okay, that's also true. He didn't fall for my trap, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't fall for my trap. My mortars have that hex pre-sighted. <laughs> These guys way up here. That's how, how do you think those casualties got there in the first place? <laughs> yeah, I was being French on parade. There you go. Uh, all right. So now let's take these guys from Golf Ten and uh, uh, where should we put them? Zoom out a little bit. Let's, Let's advance them to goal fate. Two hexes north, please. Right. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. That's easy with your movement rate. Uh, the guys from golf 11 to golf 9. Did you want to maybe move the, that first stack into golf 7? If they stop where they're stopped right now, that douche can see them. But if uh, in Golf 7, I believe oh, Deuce will see them too. I, in, in, yeah, I can see them in, in, in Golf 7 too. And you can see them from the hill up north, I believe, too, when I put them in Golf 7. Am I right? Um, <laughs> the guys yeah, in, uh, yeah, in Foxtrot cool. 1. Yeah. Alright. So you, you see too many, you know, too, too much stuff. Well, the point of the game is to get the Viet Minh off the high ground. Yeah, we see, we see, yep. we see your little air base too. Yeah, and you did a logistical miracle and bring heavy artillery on top of that hit, and that's you know, not fun. <laughs> yep. All right, so let's take these guys from uh, Golf Eleven and move them to Golf Nine. Um, light machine gun, I believe. Yep, a, uh, a different. Uh, I don't know, it's the same one. Mm -hmm. All right. F and now. I gotta learn this, this nomenclature. Okay. Yeah. I'm not quite familiar with French weapons too. All right. So uh, the guys from so Navarre can actually move with his half squad, I believe, uh, because he wasn't shooting anything. Navarre can move with. With the half squad. With not the, the one operating the yeah. light one. Exactly. Yep. <clears throat> So one, two, three. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, so let's put them in M9. Uh, my kind, yes, I one, yes. two, three, four, five. That's easy to do. So okay. yeah, uh, for everyone in the chat, movement rate is four for infantry units. Unless you have a leader with you, then it goes up to six. The officer, we assume, knows where he's going. So, we assume. And he hurries the men along. <laughs> okay, and that's believe it's all for my movement, and now we can do the assault. So now we do uh, a defensive fire from the Viet Minh, if there is any. I can't take this because I use them in opportunity fire. Can't do that because I use them in opportunity fire. Um, these guys can't reach anything. One, two, three, four. Yeah, this is because my entire army is armed with submachine guns. Their younger brothers will have a very different experience with AKs, and that's why, uh, actually, in in Vietnam games, not Indochina games, Vietnam games, the uh, Viet Cong and NVA actually enjoys a range edge advantage over the Americans who are firing 223 Remington five range bullets versus their 30 caliber 762 six range bullets. Uh, and they don't have get... problem with the jamming uh, guns. Yeah, that's also true. Okay, yeah, that's going to be it for my defensive fire, because nothing else I see can reach you. Uh, I, I do have a mortar. Hold on, I do have a mortar. Who is calling okay. something with the mortar? This guy can see something. Um...
Is he within range of the mortar? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, he is. All right, so I'm going to fire him off my mortar. The mortar is worth a total of... Uh, this guy's going to fire the mortar. He gets a negative one. So it's a negative one and a, and a six. Plus two for your woods. So it's a six net of plus one. All right. And I, you know what? I rolled this in count because I keep forgetting to turn on the webcam. Here we go. A uh, 10. Okay, so a 10 becomes an 11. No effect. I have to remember to turn on the friggin' webcam. Otherwise, when I get a good roll, oh, that's two good rolls without the camera on it. What the hell? All right. <laughs> that's gas talking, not me. <laughs> All right. So um, it would be gas, yeah. And you know what? He's actually, he's absolutely right to say that. If I'm going to host a game, I should, you know, make sure that I'm not, uh, that, you know, everything's above the table, so to speak. Okay, yeah. so that's it for my defensive fire okay we now go to um our turn sequence here defensive fire advance and assault phase so every one of your units can now move one hex unless they are pinned or they're going to do an assault okay even if they fire they get to move now all right so let's get these guys from golf nine and move them to fox rotate if they can oh yeah gotcha Oh, Excel, what are you doing? It just duplicate. It tried to send you reinforcements. All right, let's try that again. Select two pieces and move to F8. There we go. Cool. Okay, uh, now let's take these guys from mic 12 and put them on mic 11. So we're slowly starting to move up because I think I'm going to run, run out of time when it comes to trying to do anything to you. Um, uh, and... Yeah, the Vietnamese, the Viet Minh does have a little bit of backfield, but some hexes are completely un, un, unoccupied. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, and now, let's assault. Well, let's try to assault this uh, this bamboo house you're sitting in. Dun, dun. Everybody, spoilers. <laughs> assault or why you play Valorant Victory. This yep. is the shit, is assaults. We have a French Let's put a grenade in. Oh, you're going to be putting in more than one grenade, I'm assuming. Um, yep. Okay, so let's go through the motion. Assault is not a fire phase. Assault is when you're literally fixing bayonets, E-tools, grenades, boots, uh, bamboo spears, or whatever, and you go into the enemy hex, and you just literally just start tearing people apart. And they are bloody. They are hella bloody. They're hella risky. Um... However, he has done the needful in a couple of places. He's pinned down some enemy units, so we're going to see what's going on here. He's also elite. He also has a good officer in there. He's got a solid officer, Lieutenant Marceau. Um, by the way, for people in the chat, you may notice that all of my French officers are named after French actresses, many of them in James Bond films, so just deal with that. Um, <laughs> okay, so the French have a total of nine grenades available to them. Obviously, everyone has some grenades. These are like grenade counters. Uh, and the Viet Minh only have six. So the Viet Minh can throw in one grenade per infantry unit that they have active in the hex. So because this is desperate and because um, this is an objective hex, I'm throwing in the maximum number of grenades. Again, I only have six. So I'm throwing in half of my available grenades right now. He can throw in four uh, if he wants. So the, you can throw three grenades and the third one is for the light machine gun or... Uh, oh, uh, oh, 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 no, you're totally right. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me honest. Yes, uh, that is not an actual infantry unit. The, the machine gun cannot throw a grenade by itself. I, I just, I literally just saw three counters. Thank you. No, no, no. I was just, I was going to ask you if a full squad counts for like uh, two grenades or something like that. Uh, but, no, okay. no, no, it doesn't. It counts as one infantry unit and there's a, mm -hmm. there's a rationale behind that. And yeah, and I will throw in three grenades because I want this assault to succeed. You can throw in four if you want, because while this only counts uh, as okay. one, the, the officer can throw in one as well. So, so the we reason shall, why, we go with four. For, for people in the chat, the reason why a full squad can only throw one grenade and a half squad can only throw one grenade, if you're attacking the same hex with two half squads, the game is assuming you're attacking from two directions. If you're a full squad, you're all running in behind one grenade, and you can't throw two grenades. You throw in the grenade, it's, you know, that's that's the rationale. Um, so, four grenades, one for the officer, half squad, half squad, full squad. He's got them to spare. 
Come on, machine. That gives a total of four grenades. Oh, man, this, this hooch is uh, going to be uh, blowing up to pieces here. <laughs> it's not going to be too much left of this hooch when it's done. Okay, so the assault is declared. No takebacks. Here we go. This no longer applies. Um, first thing that happens, these two pinned down half squads instantly die. I do not get opportunity to fire. I do not. They do not count. What? E okay, even if this assault succeeds, it's going to cost them. The cost is based largely on the number of infantry units that were in the hex. Pinned infantry units do not count in that cost calculation. They literally just gave up or they died instantly. So what we're really looking at here is this. That's why I was only able to throw in two grenades. So my full squad can only throw in one grenade. My half squad could throw in one grenade. And then the same with his full and half squads. Okay, so this is going to get nasty. You add up all the numbers and you... Um, you add up all the numbers and you uh, you arrive at an odds uh, column and you round in favor of the defender. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine total points. Okay. I got thirteen. He has thirteen. That is one to one. However, yep. he gets to subtract one for his. Uh, hold on, I'm going to do this on the on the map or on the on the dice box so everyone can see what I'm doing because there's a lot of modifiers here. He gets to subtract one from his roll. Again, subtracting is good. He wants to subtract one from his roll because of uh, Lieutenant Marceau. He gets to subtract four for his um, four for his four grenades. I get to add two for my two grenades. So what we wind up with is he gets to subtract three from his roll. And no, terrain bonuses do not count yet. I'll get to that in just a second. So it's risky. He has to roll a 6 or less on 2d6. That's not good. However, he gets to subtract 3 from his roll. So what he really needs here is a 9 or less on 2d6. And I actually hope you succeed on this. I hope too. <laughs> and it's a 7. Okay, so that's a successful assault. Successful assault. First thing that happens, all these grenades are gone. I love removing calendars from the board. It makes me laugh. Goodbye, machine grenades. Okay, one full squad, one half. Uh, yeah, one full squad, one half. One full squad, one half squad, are all destroyed. A successful assault, and again, it's a binary state. You either rolled, made the roll, or you didn't. A successful assault automatically wipes out the defending force. Period. Now. The winning team gets to occupy that hex. Now we pay the bill. How you assess the cost of an assault is the number of enemy infantry units that were in the hex plus any terrain bonus. So there were two enemy infantry units in the hex. Yes, the full squad only counts as one. Again, this is why, is it one fire team with all its guns pointing in one direction, or two, or one squad with all its guns pointing in one direction, or two fire teams covering two different angles? Well, when the French came in through the side door, there was nobody watching. So, again, the game does kind of take that into account. To make it short, it's the terrain bonus plus the number of enemy infantry units in the hex. There were two enemy infantry units in the hex, and that's a plus two building. So 2 plus 2 is 4. That costs you 4 casualty points. And we will... Uh, now, one way we you will can... pin everything. Okay. 1, 2, th one, two 3, 4. I don't know if I recommend that. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. You can reach me with enemy, this guy enemy, saying why everything can charge else. you. Now, <laughs> now, you can kind of do okay. a combination of the two. You can. Like, I know what to do. Okay, go ahead. I will think I will reduce the squad to a half squad and pin them, that doesn't... and pin the two other uh, half squads. Um, I, you, you don't have to. Okay, so you, you know, what, I'm going to back up the Excel spreadsheet here just for a second. Mm -hmm. It's 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 not even that bad. All right, so that full squad is worth six casualty points. You're going to knock it down to a half squad. Uh, so it's three casualty points that's and three, only need that, to that's, pin one. That's yes? three casualty points. Then you can pin that same unit for the fourth. Yeah. Boom. Uh, let's do this this way. And now those other 
guys are, are good to go. Now you've now you've assessed all uh, all those cash. Now you've uh, you you paid your bill. You've you've assessed all four casualty points. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't cool. look like much of a difference, but that six for a full squad versus my four for a full squad. Again, it's just my troops are all. Yeah, yeah, I can see what you're yeah. getting on because next turn, uh, naturally, on, on your face, you could uh, simply run down. And take the hex for yeah, food. Yeah, again, it depends <laughs> on, it, and that would be, I mean, if, that, if I took that whole stack, this is what happens with Dylan sometimes in Somalia. One, two, that would have been three, four, and then five for the officer. Five times, and I automatically capture them, because, you know, I own the hex now, you can't evacuate them. That's five times double victory points. That's, that, that's game. Um, yep. These modern war games, guys, where I play in Valorant Victory, the, the free world player, the, the, the elite forces player, has to be so careful. If the enemy manages to overrun a single hex, you basically have a Black Hawk down kind of a defeat. Um, and that's intentional. We are desperately, we are definitely trying to do that in the game expansion where we uh, enforce that kind of uh, asymmetrical victory conditions. Also, you have to roll for booby traps. I don't. Also, you have to evaluate your wounded. I don't. If there are civilians on the board, you have to watch out for civilians. I don't. Um, but then again, you have much better troops, a lot more firepower, support out the ass, and that's when, uh, you know, the other half of that asymmetrical uh, equation comes into it. Yep, that's true. Okay, so that's uh, going to complete your turn, except for the after action phase. After action phase, we do two things. We try to evacuate casualties and rally troops that are pinned down. So what do you want to try and do first? Okay, let's try to evacuate the casualties first. Okay, uh, this is complete house rule, so I'll explain it super fast. How we evacuate casualties is basically that unit has to make a rally check. So how do you make a rally check? You have to roll six or less on 2d6. Unless you are E elite, which, hey, look, this guy is. He's foreign legion. He's gone to extra first aid training and so on and so forth. He has to roll a seven or less. If there was an officer in that hex, he would um, apply his bonus because he's basically helping the guy out and directing him how to do it. So, in this case, you have to roll 7 or less on 2d6. Okay. It's a 7. That's all. Oh, he made it. He made it. If he was so one ready, casualty is... If, uh, he is now a regular casualty as opposed to a unsecured casualty. So, I don't... I get normal points for him, not double. So, when I keep the score over here, this guy died. This guy did not, mm -hmm. so he's upside down. He counts as four points. He counts as two points. This guy, make a bleed-out check. Uh, again, you have to roll a five or a six, or you have to try to not roll a five or a six on one D6. Uh, God damn it, he died. It's okay, five. so that's an <clears throat> unsecured casualty. The, the guy was trying to help his buddy, and um, that's where you get the actual like drama of the game or whatever. He, by the time this guy got to the second casualty, he had already he had already bled to death. Okay, let's get to some good news. Um, this guy can rally. He rallies normally on a six or less. He's elite. It's a seven or less. He has a plus one officer with him. It's an eight or less. Eight or less on two d six, please. It's an eight. He barely made it. Now, these guys all make the same rally. However, they don't get the negative one bonus because the officer is pinned down along with them. However, they are still elite. So one at a time, we're going to roll for the officer first. Try to roll a 7 or less on 2d6. It's a 7. I'm going to do the math. He barely so made it. Lucky. Next guy. <laughs> 7 or less. It's a 5. He made it. This guy. It's a nine, so he did not five, so uh, This guy here, okay. last guy. It's a seven. All right, so we have some mixed results there. Okay, and I think that concludes the turn. Yep. All right, so now we're going to go to the Viet Minh turn, which will be a little bit shorter because I'm, I'm on defense. Okay. Holy crap, he just totally wiped out that forward unit. I can't move around too much because there's a sniper that gets automatic opportunity fire on me if I'm within range and line of sight. So I have to be careful. That, that was planned. That was oh, yeah. uh, one that, good that, thing that I did. That, that was a good placement. <laughs> that, that was, no, no, that was a good assault. You pinned down enemy units, and then you assaulted with grenades and officers. That's exactly how you're supposed to do it. Um, you didn't move around too much. 
uh, when you scatter your guys around in too many different places, you wind up with too many booby trap checks. Yeah, it's actually going pretty well so far. Economy um, of power. Now, what do I got here? All right, so first I'm going to do my command phase. Um, command phase, command phase, command phase. I literally have to, I think, replace the battery in my mouse. Because that's what keeps causing these little screw-ups. All right, I'm going to go ahead and divide that half squad into two, or that full squad into two half squads. Uh, one question, Oris, can yep. I so do your stuff, but uh, do you think, uh, have you thought of combining uh, all the households that you have made up and putting them into one PDF so, so that uh, we can use them uh, in, uh, in our games? Uh, or, That's actually not a bad them? idea. They're mostly written. They're just written over here in these... Uh in these uh, in these tables and so on mm -hmm. um where the big valor and victory community is is on board game geek so i am in touch with some people this actually you know i can go ahead and make this announcement now uh, i am in touch with some of the people who are in actually own valor and victory uh not barry mm -hmm. doyle himself but there are some people that are maybe thinking about taking it to a video game format and I'm in touch with them. They saw our Vol River Crossing game for Operation Market Garden. Uh, they okay. like the map. So I might wind up designing some maps for them. We're still, that's by no means confirmed. We're still working on that. And again, some of the people on Board Game Geek in the community are working on um, some other expansions and they're talking about modern games. So I may wind up doing that uh, because people are interested in playing Valor and Victory in the modern setting. Some of them are people who have seen our streams. Some of them are people who do it on their own. Valor and Victory and what Barry Doyle has done to it. If I was the Pope, I would make this man a saint. I swear to God. Um, <laughs> he designed this game. He designed it based on one of the most popular war games of the 1980s, Advanced Squad Leader. He streamlined it. He made it easier to play because Advanced Squad Leader was really advanced um, to the point where it was becoming unplayable. So he took his favorite game, he made it where everybody could play it, he printed it up, he put it online for free, this game costs you zero friggin' dollars and zero cents, and the community that has exploded around this thing since like 2006, 2007, uh, is, is amazing. There's a guy on Board Game Geek who has done Mars Attacks in Valor and Victory. Oh yeah, I saw that one. One of the one <laughs> of the things me and Gianna might do, and uh, again maybe later on in the spring or the summer, we always keep talking about doing Star Wars in Valor and Victory, making up stormtrooper squads and rebel commando squads and things like that. Um, like you know, th it's it's literally, um, I have run across problems uh, as far as expanding and, and and printing out my rules and so on and so forth. Um, the Somalia game finally started to show some cracks. Where it's like, okay, you're really pushing the game now. And what happens there is in the makeup of what is a half squad. A half squad is basically a four-man fire team. So what's... Oh, that's, a, that's an officer there. I shouldn't use that. What is actually in a four-man fire team um, is, is the quantum level or the particle level of this game. Okay, It's what those numbers are, what they could be. And once you get into 1993, every American fire team also has a grenade launcher and a light machine gun. Um, so every single fire team now has two support weapons in it, including one of them with explosive and anti-tank properties. Very, very light anti-tank properties, but some anti-tank uh, capability. Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole idea of support weapons, you know, these kind of things, basically you have to take this, this, and a grenade launcher, like an M79 grenade launcher or a Panzerfaust or something like that, and you have to combine it all into one counter, because that's literally the building block of modern armies, post-1993, or post-1991 even. And that's where the game, uh, that's where the game starts to get shaky. Um, you can add uh, the anti-tank uh, factor on the counter uh, for the American infantry. That's, that's that literally what we did. Yeah, that, that's, that's oh, almost exactly... Cool. Uh, uh, if I can go to my, we're kind of off the topic here, but I, I pretty much have to wrap up the stream uh, very shortly anyway, but just for now. Um, we're kind of off the rails here, guys. Bear with me for just a second. Valor and Victory. Um, Valor and Victory 1990s. Completed counters. Where is my U.S. forces here? So U.S. half squad. Yeah, so what you're talking about is exactly what we did. Um, as soon as oh, that's cool. 
it's taking its time opening up this file. Pretty please open this file. <laughs> My computer is running too much stuff right now. OBS mm -hmm. is not the most friendly. Um, and now I've opened it twice, but anyway. Okay, yeah, so there's the normal fire. That number is, this is for a half squad. Notice there's only one figure on the map. For a half mm -hmm. squad, the firepower is six. That's the exact same as your full squads. My full squads in in V and Benfu are only a five. This is a half squad with a six. So that's because every single one of these half squads has an M249 saw in it. So every mm -hmm. one of these, so basically you take the number for fully automatic M16s, three round burst, M16, M16A2s, plus you have to add the numbers that would normally be in an M249 saw. That's at least a two or a three. It's a belt fed, rapid fire, 200 rounds in a box, automatic weapon. You have to combine that. That's where you get that very high number. So normally you get, like your half squads are threes because you all have automatic weapons. My half squads are twos because they're all automatic weapons, except I'm also not very well trained. Might be admin guys. So you start off with a three. A light machine gun that is belt fed. All your light machine guns in this game so far are magazine fed. But the big ones, the belt fed ones that don't have to stop every 20 or 30 bullets, those are threes. Like an MG42 is a three. An M1919 is a three. So you have three and three together. That's where you get the six. These numbers are not random. I designed them. But I did not just pick the numbers out of a hat. Five is the range. We already know about that. And, of course, that's the casualty factor. That's based on the, the training of the men. So already mm -hmm. it's ridiculously overpowered. This half squad can destroy almost any full squad in any game before it. Again, 1993. However, then I went ahead and added 3-1-A. This is the grenade uh, launcher factor. So it's a three if I use it as an explosive weapon. Um, no, I'm sorry. Three is the range. Three is the range. Uh, I get to fire once per turn with it because there's only one grenade launcher in the group. And A is the anti-tank factor. So I had to add a whole fourth corner onto the math on these counters. And this is where, again, we had one game with LSR Live here on this very stream um, on Sit Rep Podcast. It did work. But this is where we're starting to... We haven't hit the wall yet as far as how far you can expand Valorant Victory. But I think we now see the wall. We're, we're getting to the point where it's like, okay... Um, we're, there's almost more house rules than regular rules, and that's okay. where we start to uh, start to have an issue. Cool. Um, but then again, when you're doing something fun like Star Wars or Mars Attacks, you're just like, I'll oh, put some numbers on there, make the counters look pretty, and have fun. But if you're trying to do it semi-historically and actually, you know, do it, you know, right, uh, for lack of a better word, um, there is a little bit of analysis that goes into the math, or maybe not analysis, uh, methodology. Okay, so um, that's it for my command phase. I gave away my heavy artillery, but no big deal. This is just a demo game. Um, I'm going to go into my direct fire phase. That douche is going to take a shot. It's now a new turn, so now that douche can fire again. Uh, again, six, <coughs> net plus one. Turn on my webcam this time, so gas doesn't make fun of me. Another good roll for that douche. All right, so douche... Minus two for your woods, plus one for my officer, so it's a net bonus of one, or a net penalty of one, I should say, is five on six. I think I actually did some damage with that. Um, six, and I rolled a modified five, is three casualty points. Oh, man. All right, that hex has hmm. to take three casualty points. So actually, they're dead if I... See correctly. Um, some of them are dead. <clears throat> if you pin him and pin him, you still are short one, so you can't do that. You could kill him. But that's only one casualty. You still have to kill that squad. That wouldn't work. The only viable yeah. solution that I can see is to kill that squad or half squad. Okay, let's do that. Right. And pin the heavy machine gun. Yes. Okay. Now in. Book Valorant Victory, the heavy... It's not a, it's a medium machine gun. The medium That's machine gun machine. goes with the squad. Now, there are games like Valorant... Like Advanced Squad Leader that this is based on where that machine gun is left and the officer picks it up. Mm -hmm. If he wants to. Um, so, but book rules in the book say that 
uh, that machine gun is gone. The way we sometimes do it, and it, 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 again, this is a friendly game, is the other guy can pick up the weapon. But uh, just, so... for, just for people in the chat, just for people in the chat, when people... Uh, strict black and white rules in Valor and Victory are whenever the guy, the, 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 wep- the unit is destroyed, the weapon is destroyed as well. Um... That's just because the game gets out of hand. More realistic games like Advanced Squad Leader allow other people to pick up that weapon. That counter, that's not a machine gun team. You can't pin a support weapon. That is the literal metal piece of equipment. That's all it is. You can't pin it down. Uh, So these guys died. The machine gun's laying there. The officer picks it up and he runs around. Now, again, that is a house rule. Oh, what am I doing? Uh, okay, I'm taking him off, and I'm replacing him with an unsecured casualty. I forgot I was playing uh, Modern Warrior for a second. So, the officer is probably going to try and get his men out of there before he picks up the machine gun, but um, we'll get to that when we get to that. So that's it for him. Um, no one else is moving. The mortar is going to go ahead and try and drop another fire mission on that guy who evacuated that other group. Alrighty, here we go. Oh, Jesus. Okay, I'm going to show the camera for that one. Uh, that winds up with an 11, uh, so that mortar fire did no damage. Um, that hex is just the worst hex in the world for the French right now. Uh, yeah. And I think that's going to be about it. I don't think these guys can reach yet. One, two, three, four. I do have a light machine gun in there. I'll take a shot with the light machine gun, only because your sniper's already on the table. I don't have to worry about rolling box cars. And there's a negative two officer in there. So negative two officer plus two for your hooches. I can only throw in two points, so it's two with no with no uh, net modifier. And I apologize if I'm going super fast, but I am trying to get through the turn so we can end out the stream. Okay, so um, I'm only on this red column at the very top or red row at the very top, no modifiers, and I wind up with an eight, which is no effect. That's going to end direct fire phase. We go to Viet Minh movement phase. I don't think the Viet Minh want to move, to be perfectly honest. The Viet Minh will not move. We now go to your defensive fire phase. You had no opportunity fire phase because I did not move. That sniper is taking care of that. There are some guys I could move in some directions where the trees would give me cover, but I literally just don't want to. So with no Viet Minh movement phase, there is no uh, French... Uh, opportunity fire phase. However, what immediately follows opportunity fire is defensive fire. So defensive fire is all your units can shoot and anything that they can see if they want. I believe I I think that the guy from Golf 8 can see or this guy in the... He can see... <clears throat> in the yeah, yeah, uh, line of sight is almost universally a two-way street. So mm-hmm. if I could see you, you could see me. True. So... Uh, we will try uh, to call in the mortars to show that uh, guys. That in the dude pitches. just lit up my machine gun team. Call in some. Now, can the mortars reach? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes. Your mortars okay. can reach the douche crew. So let's do this. <clears throat> All right. So that is negative one for your officer who's calling in the mission, plus two for my buildings. It's a net plus one. The mortar is worth six. So it's six and a plus one. White row. Oh my god, it's a three. A three plus one becomes a four. Four. A four is on six. That is four casualty points. There's only three casualty points in that hex. (laughs) Come on. Kabam! Order, what do you That's unfair. Me, man? I, I'm, I'm using my pledge break here to... Uh... Actually, no, it's, it's really not. Because, honestly, in an actual Valor and Victory game where I'm playing for Moderns, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, no, wait. 8 and 8 is 16, 20, versus 1, 2, 3, oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. In a true Valorant Victory Moderns game, I am currently winning this game 20 to 11. 
Yeah. Make that 24 to 11 if you successfully evacuate that guy. That's at a 4 to 1 cash a victory point differential, which is what we do for, like, Viet Cong versus Marine Corps or something like that, or PLO versus IDF. I do not suggest we do that in this. Like I said, we were throwing around with the idea of a 3 to 1 or a 2 to 1. But, again, I only have to kill a few of your guys to claim victory. That's also, cool. at this moment... I still control four of the victory hexes, so I get 20 points because of victory hexes. The score right now, even if we go down, even if we go down to a two to one, let's pretend this is a two to one. Two plus four plus four because they they died, so that's a grand total of mm -hmm. four plus four plus two is ten. We're assuming this guy lives, or it gets evacuated. That's going to be 12. And you own one uh, one victory hex so far. That's 17 is your score right now. Okay. Um, meanwhile, no, sorry. What am I doing? I've scored 12 points of casualties, and I own four of the victory hexes. That's 20 points. It's five points per victory hex. So that's 20 plus 12 is 32. You have one victory point, or one victory hex that's worth five, plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Um, the score is like 20, what did I say, like 22 to 11, although I did screw up one thing. You conducted a successful assault here, and there were two infantry units in that hex? That's supposed to be two POWs. I forgot about that. <coughs> um, so let's retroactively go back to the end of your turn two, real quick. And, uh, you uh, had... sorry, and... I don't know if you added the casualties from the hex that I just blew into pieces. <laughs> I believe. I uh, or did you just erase them from the map? Oh shit! Did oh. I? Uh, I'm not sure. Hold on. Because there was an, a zero officer, uh, medium machine gun, and uh -huh. half squad. Yep, yep, yep. You are right. I think you're right. Because um, I was going to go back to turn one and count. But yeah, there's no there's no officers down there, so that's definitely not correct. Yes, that is true. Thank you. And okay, if we retroactively go back to the end of your turn two, super fast, one guy was pinned. Uh, you had no casual. T oh boy. Half squad. I'm making a lot of mistakes. One full squad was. Uh, yeah. Was down to a half squad. All right, we, we have a little bit of bookkeeping issues here, uh, but I, that's my fault. Okay, so this is going back to turn one. We had two casualties here, one died and one didn't. Then you got on there, the other guy died, and then you evacuated one successfully. You know what we never did? We never applied the casualty that this full squad knocked down to. So there was a full squad here. You knocked him down to a half squad. That counts as a casualty. Yep. So I forgot to do that. Here's another thing I forgot, and then we'll assume that you successfully, because uh, uh, you had all kinds of guys in there. So you rallied him. This guy would have uh, successfully evacuated that casualty. Then you have an officer left, although the officer was assumed to be uh, successfully, redu uh, the, the officer was helping rally that pin down squad, so he was busy. This guy can try to evacuate one of these POW counters, so try to roll a seven or less. Uh, again, that's elite troop rally check without officer bonus. It's a five. Okay, so you success, sex, ooh, you successfully evacuated one POW counter. So you get additional points for taking prisoners rather than just killing people. And I will replace that with one. So one of these kills gets converted into a POW. And he's worth uh, the same amount that these guys are worth, only they're bonuses to you rather than penalties. So that's how the free world forces can sometimes come back from a very, very vicious and very cruel uh, math system. Whereas every time you lose a single figure, I get four points or maybe eight points in a full asymmetrical game. Um, we might make it three and six. We might make it two and four, but it's definitely going to be more than one, which is what you get when you kill one of my guys. The only way that you can really kind of climb out of that hole if you take too many casualties is to come back with prisoners. 
Because free world forces mm. love prisoners. They come back, they bring the prisoners back, and those prisoners give up positions. So that guy is going to be tied to a chair somewhere, and you might not take all the high ground, you might take too many casualties, but you know what? This guy is going to be locked up in a basement somewhere, you know, duct taped to a chair, and he's going to be giving up positions on some of that Viet Minh artillery. And then that's going to well, be... That's, that, yeah. That's going to be... That's, uh, what, that's going to help out with French airstrikes. True. True. That's what actually the French were trying to do around the Npin Fu. They were, you know, gathering information through patrols, trying to get some prisoners. That's, that's literally what, yeah, this is the early part of the Npin Fu, obviously. We're not doing the overruns yet. Uh, I have to make up special maps for that. But um, that's pretty much going to be it. Uh, that, that's, that's what the objectives of the game are from a game design perspective. And I'm pretty sure that's going to be it for my turn. My mortar has missed, my, uh, my douche crew has fired... You took your def Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have any more defensive fire? I got sidelined uh, by, uh, by by math problems. I don't think so. No. Okay. So then we go to my end of the fire phase. I have no assault and move. I think I really want to do. Do I want to pull him off of there? I don't want to lose that officer. But it, that's the only hex I can really see a lot from. Erg, Actually, yeah, I'm gonna pull him back. Um, I think that's it. Yep. Then I go to my end of action phase. I have no one to, I don't have to evacuate. I don't have to do anything like that. And I don't have to secure any prisoners and I have no one to rally. So that's going to conclude Viet Minh turn two. And again, when that douche crew blew up, that was an objective hex. So maybe I should, uh, hmm. well, that takes place after my movement. So I can't run down there and grab that hex again. That's the bad news for me. Uh, when we come back, you know, later on in the week and we do turn three, uh, you might be able to reach out there and grab that hex. If you guys can reach uh, out. I don't know. We'll try. All right, guys. So unless anyone has any more questions, how would Rangers match up against a German squad with an MG42? We have a, a question in the chat. C. Brenner. Oh, my God. C. Brenner, I haven't seen you in a dog's age. How are you doing, sir? Welcome to our surprise stream. And I hope that you and your family are staying safe with all this craziness going around. Um, I apologize I didn't see that before. I'm in, kind of stuck in the middle of the game. And we have Rasmus here. How you doing there, Mr. Rasmus? Cool. Uh, again, I know the stream is totally unscheduled, guys. I'm literally doing it on my lunch hour, which is now well <clears> over. <throat> I have to get back to work here for my boss start asking where I'm at. All right, guys. Um, so welcome again. Or I should say thanks to everyone for coming out to our surprise uh, DM Ben Fu stream. Um, we're going to come back later on in the week and maybe uh, play some more of this. I don't know if we're going to be doing this on Twitch or not, but um, um, Piotr and I are definitely going to finish up this game. Uh, but for now, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Everyone stay safe with all the uh, all the knucklehead nonsense going on around the world. So stay indoors, stay safe, wash your hands. Thanks very much for supporting Sit Rep Podcast as always. Oh, before I answer, uh, before I sign off, uh, I was going to ask, uh, I was going to answer Gaz's question. How would Rangers match up against a German squad with an MG42? Okay, so an MG, a German rifle squad in Valorant Victory, rifle squad, has a 4, um, a firepower. An SS squad usually has a 6. That's because they either are carrying Sturmgewehrs or submachine guns or something like that. Um, the MG42 then carries a, uh, a 3. Um of uh, fire so in in world war ii uh native so to speak in, in in real published valor and victory that would have to be two counters um it would be a full squad that's a six i think it's i think it's a four a four six four that's a basic wehrmacht un relatively untrained you know not untrained but you know not like elite not gross deutschland not das reich anything like that um division would be four six four with a 37 um, MG42 stacked with it. Again, that full squad could be a two half squads all in the same X. That would also be legal. Where it would be 362, no, I'm sorry, 262, 262, and um, again, 37. Uh, that would be a full eight man squad, either in one or two fire teams, with one MG42. Uh, it would be up against a half squad of Rangers with a firepower of six plus 
No, it's just a firepower of six. And okay, well, why is that? That that sounds crazy. Again, that rifle squad starts off with rifles, five or ten round either Mausers or Gewehr 43s or something like that. You know, semi-automatic rifles and one light machine gun. Meanwhile, we have the American Rangers who have all automatic weapons in the form of M16A2s, three round bursts at the very least plus a basically their own MG42 in the form of a saw. Now, the MG42 has the same firepower rating that's based on rate of fire. MG42s and M249 saws are both very, very fast firing weapons. The MG42, I will admit, would have a, an edge in range because it fires a 7.92 millimeter Mauser bullet uh, versus a 5.56 NATO ball. So the, the, the Mauser would, or I should say, the MG42 shoots at a longer distance. But the firepower would end up being about the same. Uh, four American Rangers versus eight Wehrmacht infantry, the number would be about the same. Um, yeah, the Rangers would call in a war. Yeah, the, the, Ameri the, the Germans would have an engine range. That's if the Germans were, were, uh, were carrying rifles. If it's a STG-44 squad or a, uh, an MP-40 squad or something like that, an MP-44 squad if you prefer, uh, instead of STG-44, then it becomes a lot more balanced. Because, yeah, it's automatic assault rifles, basically, and a light machine gun, and eight men instead of four men. That's when the Germans would actually get a little bit of an edge. Because um, there's just numbers, you know. So that's where it, gets, uh, that's where it starts to get a little crazy. The only other difference is that, that Ranger Squad, to complete the answer to uh, Gas's question, that Ranger Squad also carries a grenade launcher, which in World War II terms is a two centimeter mortar. Um, so, yeah, I think the Rangers still kind of went out on that one. Uh, again, it's just technology. And again, your Rangers versus Waffen SS or versus Elite Fairmarkt, they're both elite troops. So their casualty points would be roughly the same. They have about the same firepower, but the Germans would edge them out in casualty points. In other words, the amount of meat they can put in front of bullets, because there's eight men in question instead of uh, four men. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, cool. Uh, 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 C. Brenner, I'm glad everyone's doing great. And um, awesome. All right, guys, so now I'm really going to end the stream. Uh, I forgot about that question. I want to answer the question. So thanks very much, Piotr, for our for accommodating us on our last minute stream. Uh, super appreciate it. And again, I appreciate everyone's support. Stay safe, stay healthy. I'm gonna play our uh, our Blackside Studio ad, and then I'm gonna go ahead and close out the stream. So thanks again, everybody, okay. and I'll be in touch later on this week. Thanks for watching, and thanks for the game, Jim. Nope, no problem. Uh, again, we'll be back, uh, you know, later on this week. Are you looking to become a Tier 1 operator in the gaming world? Elevate your games with Black Sight Studio Terrain.